Good evening. Welcome to Edge Hill University's Festival of Ideas. Um, it's Thursday, so it must be Joe McGann. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm absolutely delighted to have Joe here uh, this, this evening. Just want to put, flag up the, the enormous uh, slide in front of you, which uh, is the web address of all of the events that we've got going on at the Festival of Ideas over the next couple, couple of weeks. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of that maybe at the end. Um, so tonight we have Joe McGann, star of Stage and Screen. Um, and we're going to talk about Joe's uh, life and his career. And we've got some clips of some of the work that he has done uh, Glad for, I can't see. <laughs> for, for TV and TV and film. Um, and we'll get to those, I guess, in, in a moment. But let me begin, uh, Joe, by asking you, tell us a little about uh, where you grew up and growing up in a, a house of talented actors. A ah, bunch of nutters. Um, we grew up <clears throat> in Kensington. I was born in the Dingle. Uh, Mum and Dad lived in the Dingle for a while. And then we moved in with Mum's parents in Myrtle Gardens, the bottom of Myrtle Street, till Dad, uh, who worked at Yorkshire Imperial just along the way, along East Lanks Road, uh, he decided to do, he, he took permanent shift work uh, so that he got a little bit more, more money and we got a mortgage. I was talking the other day. It seems strange that they took a 25-year mortgage, Mum and Dad, for, so we were upwardly mobile. They took a 25-year mortgage for £1,500. I mean, God forgive me, I've spent more on a suit. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Think about it. So, but they did, and we were upwardly mobile, and, 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 and they bought a house on Kensington, um, which was different then from how it's kind of been run down now. Um, it was pretty much an idyllic childhood. You know, sort of we, we still went to school at St Anne's uh, in Overbury Street, which is where the church where Mum and Dad were baptised, where they, oh, well, they were married, not baptised, they were baptised in the Dingle. But, and so we all went to school there. And... So I was born in 58, so by the time I was five, six, everyone in the world knew where Liverpool was because of the Beatles. It was an amazing place to be. I mean, we lived right on the edge of the, of the inner city. So we used to see people there all the time, you know, from all over the world. So Liverpool felt like an important place to be from. So we had that recognition there. You know, uh, it was, there were also great social experiments going on at the time. Uh, the reason I refer to that is the fact that as kids, I suppose, different from these days, there was always someone to do the extracurricular activities. And living in the small house we did, it was better that we were out. I mean, you know, seven of us in a three-bedroom house. It got loud. It's the loudest place in the world. Um, but we were always out. We did everything from, you know, athletics, scouts, you know, quizzes in the library, which we lived opposite, which was like our internet, of course, but pre-internet. We had a library 50 yards from the house. Mum and dad were always those kind of people who, if we didn't, they, they didn't know anything, they said, go and find it out. So it was this kind of encouraging atmosphere all the, all the time. And as far as the show business end of it is concerned, or, 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 or that side of it, just again by luck, the school we went to, uh, St. Anne's and Overbury Street, the, the church, uh, there was a priest there called Father Donald Gordon, who had a choir, he ran the choir. But he was also the convener for the British end of an, of an international choir called the Puerto Cantores. So if you, got to play, if you got to be in Father Gordon's choir, then you got to go away to Europe. Before mum and dad could ever afford to take us away, we went and sang in Belgium, we, you know, went to Germany, we went to places like this doing these big song festivals, which for football mad kids was great because we, we felt like Liverpool Football Club that we were going away. We'd play the other choirs in football. And, 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 you know, sort of, like, it, it was amazing. And we, and we got to travel a bit, all in these, these white albs with, with blue crosses, <laughs> little scallies as well. But, and, and, but you know, but, and, and something about Liverpool, then and now, I mean, sort of people, people remark it. I've lived m most of my life away from Liverpool now, although I'm back. Uh, something people always remark is the fact that people are surprised in other cities when, when I tell them, even as kids, we were doing youth theatre, we were doing the choir, we were doing karate, we were doing boxing, we were doing Liverpool Harriers, we were doing all of these different things. And no one ever said, it's a sissies game. No one ever said, oh, what are you doing acting or anything like that for? Everything was on the table. Everything, there was, there was a kind of tacit encouragement of, of, of everything bettered you. 
I suppose it comes from the Irish immigrant thing. You know, each generation, you, what your mum and dad want for you is, is that you do better than them, that you go further. It was also the 60s. It was also the, a time where mum was a, very much a proto-feminist, you know, so this was very much about, you know, like w women's power. So she kind of, she changed a little bit. My dad put his nose out, he put his nose out a little bit, you know, because, you know, so when, when my sister, who's the youngest of us, there's five of us, when my sister, the, the youngest, went to nursery, mum went to uh, university. She went to, and be, or did a, teaching, did a teaching degree. And so all around us was this kind of encouragement. All, all, my granddad, you know, uh, my, my grandma, my uncles, everyone was a reader. Everyone had their own kind of speciality. So there was this kind of autodidact impetus for all of us to try it all, to try everything. And so we did as kids, and it was great, you know, sort of, it was also good for me, mum and dad, because we, we were never in, you know, so it's, they, they got a bit of peace, you know. Um, but in, in Father Gordon's choir, once or twice a year, he used to put on like a Gilbert and Sullivan or a gang show or something like this. So from the age of nine, 10, 11, we were used to learning songs, learning words, like getting on stage and, and you know, doing the Mikado, doing the gondoliers, doing these kind of things and dressing up and, and doing it. And it didn't seem strange. It, it was normalized straight away. So perhaps that kind of had an effect on how it was later. But Liverpool at the time was, I mean, there were some, some people who were bitter that, when I say great social experiments, they were all there. You can read sociology from the time, you know, sort of people coming into Liverpool, doing all these great studies and helping for a little bit, but then taking, as, as a lot of my relatives used to say, then they take the bloody results elsewhere, you know, sort of things like this. But it was a, it was a really, really vibrant, energetic, fabulous time to be alive. I, re I remember my childhood only fondly, you know. It was a great place to grow up. It really, really was. Yeah. When did you begin to think acting could be a serious thing to do? <sighs> a couple of times. One thing that I was the eldest, so when I was about early early teens, I had to deal with my mum. In order to get the others to bed, I was I'd pretend to go up to bed as well and settle them down. And then I'd come downstairs afterwards and we'd watch whatever drama was on. You know, the, 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 the guard would be away from the fire, there'd be a plate of toast, and me and my mum would sit and talk. When she liked something, and, and the same, same with her dad and the same with some of them, when she liked like an actor or, or a film, she'd explain why. And she'd explain, so, I, so from an early age, I was conscious of the fact that these weren't just moving figures, that there were people who had jobs, that had talent. Some of them were good, some of them were bad, some of them. And, so I saw it then that, that you know that there was that thing available to us, and then I was taken, I think, uh, as a as a prize or as a, as a reward for. I wasn't passing my eleven plus. I was slightly older than that. It was something I did at, at SFX. I got into SFX. Something I did there, or, or they were trying to cheer me up because the Jesuits made me miserable. Um, that I got taken to the theatre uh, to see uh, Ghost Train by Arnold Ridley, you know, the old fella from uh, Dad's Army. Mm -hmm. He plays Godfrey. He wrote this play called uh, The Ghost Train, which has got this special effect in it where you, it mostly takes place in the waiting room of the station. And you see this amazing effect of, of a train, the ghost train going past. And I knew there was nothing backstage. I knew there was nothing else. I was utterly, utterly transfixed, not just by that, but also by the fact that these people who were on stage were earning money doing it, that this was their job. And, and that was the first time I put it together. And I think it was two or three days later, I joined Everyman Youth Theatre and started doing things and doing improvisation. And, and we'd get asked to do kind of supernumerary parts. We'd go on stage with, you know, for, for, the, people, for, the, for the shows that were on in the theatre. And this is the time, you know, sort of Jonathan Price was there, Julie Walters was there, people like that. These great, great actors that I was seeing as a kid. Interestingly enough, the, the best part for me was the fact that already I'd started to say to people, like my dad and, and, and stuff like that. What are you going to do with your life? Well, I think I want to be an actor. Don't be stupid. Get a proper job. You know, was 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 always the, the response. Uh, but backstage, I, I remember going backstage at the theatre when we were uh, doing bef just before the show was on. So they were still doing the fit up. We were going to rehearse for doing some super new movies. I think it was Mid Midsummer Night's Dream. And I could see welding sparks. I could see things being cut and sawed. I could see people walking around doing real physical work. 
and, it, and I remember getting the impression then that actually, you know, th th there's more to it than just the glitter and the stardust. This is genuinely an area, you know, and then seeing that, that the audience was full, seeing the audience come in, I, I started to put two and two together. So I always defended it, and I still do, as a proper job, you know. Um, and, I mean, the Jesuits, kind of, they, 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 at, at SFX, when I tried to get a drama thing there, no, they, they didn't want that. That was too, too frivolous. They would just about put it up with music as long as it was violin or, or this or that or the choir. Um, they didn't. They didn't. They, they they thought us more serious enough. But there was the, the Every Man New Theatre, which I went to for a little while. But then joined up with some other mates, and, and I used to go up to speak comp. There was a, a really good drama class up there, a very good drama teacher who did like kind of extracurricular stuff again. And I started doing stuff up there. I mean, we did things like I remember doing West Side Story up there and things like that. You know, sort of so. For those people who put the extra time in and, and all of that, that gave me a grounding and, and a feel for it. And it was the first thing, really, that I ever pointed my finger at, at and said, that's what I want to do. You know, the Jesuits tried to tell me I wanted to be a priest. I didn't want to be. Yeah. I didn't want that. They actually, I'd, I was talking with my brother today. We, we, we were laughing and joking. So I, I remembered that the only other job application I ever filled in and wrote a wife I was very serious about was to become a butler. <laughs> It was, true. it was absolutely true because I, I, what I knew is like because the Jesuits are telling me I'm a sinner and, and, and this and that and I was useless unless I did exactly what they said. So the way I was at the time, I could have completely abdicated my life in favour of somebody else to become a gentleman's gentleman. I thought, why not? And I wrote away to the, and got accepted in this place in Maine, in America, which, which trains butlers. And I was kind of working and saving up to kind of go and do that. You know, so that was the only other career. <laughs> that was the only other career path I looked at. You know, um, and kind of again back to Liverpool at the time. All of my friends, uh, besides doing the, the, the whatever other things, we were all football mad. We were all this and that. But everyone I knew played an instrument. Everyone I knew, including people in our house. Every you know, they used to get the latest Bowie or Rod Stewart or whatever album, and they'd go home and they'd learn the songs. So we all of us played, and it was absolutely one hundred percent normal. To us, that like kind of you know, we, we had little bands, we had little things going on, and this wasn't just our house. This wasn't just like a, a McGann thing. This is like I say, everybody I knew, and so from about 14, 15, we started putting little bands together and, and playing in in the local social club in Kenny Fields, you know, on, on, on Sacred Heart Church Club and, and St Anne's Church Club, like playing country and western one night, Black Sabbath covers another night, you know, sort of like kind of whatever, you know, doing all these things, and so it gave us and it earned a few quid. You know, so with, with a Saturday job and, and doing that, you know, I soon had enough, like, kind of... In fact, at, at 16, I got my first flat. I, I negotiated with my dad. I, I paid £4 for a flat, £4 a week, uh, for a two-bedroom flat on Bentley Road by Princess Park. But a bit, bit more expensive now. Um, but, yeah, me and my mate shared a flat. So I went to school from a flat because I, I negotiated, our Paul st still says it's like the greatest act of negotiation he's ever seen. I, I remember pr getting two keys printed, giving them to me mum and dad, because they were feared it was going to be some kind of den of iniquity. Um, but I said, no, there's the keys. I just, I, I, I need out of this house. Four, <laughs> four lads in the same room, four teenage lads in the same room, two sets of bunk beds. I can still smell it. The smelliest room in the whole world. I mean, not for any other reason than hormones and, 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 and sports, but there was also, there was always, always seemed to be a seething pile of washing in the corner. And I just wanted my own. So, and, and that's kind of, again, that's back when I went to thinking about acting, thinking about this and that, but, but playing in bands, you know. Um, and uh, I, 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 I fell into the music business more, 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 more than kind of, more by luck than good judgment, and it kept me away from acting for a few years. But in acting, then I was still determined to kind of have a go at. So, what was your first serious acting role then after that? I'm trying to think if I'm serious now. Um, yes, first one, I suppose. Let's say paid acting role. Paid or, acting roles. Or... Um, well, I did a couple of like, I think about the first five or six things I did because of my size. I played coppers, I played third copper on the left. On, on telly and fourth copper on the left, uh, on, on this and that. But I started auditioning here and there for actor musician roles because I could play, and I thought that would be my way back in. You know, sort of. Like, lots of the people I played football with, I'd already by this time moved to London. I got a job in London when I was 17. I got a job at the Marquee Club, 
And pretty soon after that, I kind of fell into, a, um, like I said, a record deal, and, and I became a songwriter for ATV Music. But I was still interested in trying to find acting, and so I'd done the music for a couple of theatre shows and, and, and worked with you know, Nigel Griffiths on a show, and Nigel Williams Rod on a show, uh, like jungle music, like putting punk music to his lyrics and, and things like this. Started doing that, and then auditioned uh, for a thing called Destry Rides again, which I played in the band. And then Paul, my brother, was doing uh, a very, very well-received drama documentary called Gaskin. And so by a, by a nose, we went to, we met the director, and there was a part in it of this young, drunk, wife-beater, ne'er-do-well. And he gave me the part. And so Paul, Paul was off doing something else, and I, I had this whole scene to film where I was going nuts in a, in a doll. And that was my first acting part, playing a playing scouser, playing a scally, playing, you know, the rougher element. But that ended up being my first paid acting role. Yeah. So then what, what happens next? Hey. Well, um, having kind of got the bug again and um, much upsetting my first, my first wife because she kind of got used to the, the regular money and the kind of money and the kind of stuff that came with the music business. I never really wanted to be the front person of a band. I never wanted that. Like I said, I wanted to be an actor. I was happy to be in the band. I was happy to be in the background. I was happy to write songs. But I still wanted to act. I still wanted to get on and do, do this thing, which, which I found magic. So having got a couple of little bits and pieces here and there, I decided to, I applied to Claire Venables, who was then running the Crucible Theatre in Sheffield. This would be 1981, 82, around there. And, no, 82, 83. And I, I, I decided to go and do rep. I'd asked her, could I go and do rep? And she'd seen me do a couple of music things and, and kind of semi-acting things in, in Liverpool, fringy things. And she said, yeah, come over. So I went over to the season there and, and was lucky enough to get involved in the rep system where I learned a lot of my craft. I mean, I'd pick, pick things up already. You can on, on this job, you know, because not everybody I know who's very, very good at the job has necessarily been trained, you know, sort of like but drama school, but you, you can pick it up. And I learned things there by, by doing TIE. We were going out doing things like Mother Courage out of the back of a van. And then on the main stage of the house, I was in The Resistible Rise of Arturo Ui. Quite a socialist agenda, as you can imagine, going on there in the People's Republic of South Yorkshire. We also did, you know, there was a panto going on. Uh, Stephen Doldry, his very first company came in there and I got drafted into his company. We did Ragged Travelers, Philanthropists. We did all kinds, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the Canterbury Tales, we did that even, you know, things like this. So I got a kind of grounding in rep. Uh, and it was there I was seen by uh, a couple of, uh, two producers, one from the BBC, one from ITV, who took it upon themselves. I mean, in, in those days it was, you know, producers did go to the theatre. There, there wasn't the proliferation of casting directors that you have now. Cast, there weren't, but there were very few casting directors then. That's kind of become a bigger thing. It was tend to be producers who went to the theatre and saw the act, saw the people, saw the, the people concerned. And I, you know, he'd, he'd been up to Sheffield Crucible, he'd seen, seen a few times, and so he offered me, um, this is a guy called Leonard Lewis, he offered me uh, a BBC series called Rockcliffe's Babies, which I know you've got a clip on. How's that for an intro? That's, That's pretty cool. True professional. Yeah, um, and, and, and that was like kind of my first brush with proper serial, proper Friday night drama and the attention of the newspapers and all that kind of thing. I think very fondly of it. It was, a, it, was a good, it was a good little show. I remember Rockcliffe's Babies very well. What we've got here, what we have here, is the, just the opening title sequence. Mm. Uh, so you need to watch out for, for Joe. <laughs> watch out for young Joe. If, 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 Callow if, youth. He if, yeah. if, if flashes up. So we're just going to dim the lights. We'll play the, it's just about 60 seconds, the opening opening titles of Rockcliffe's Babies. Did you spot him there? Yeah. Yeah, did you see him? That was um, the first, it was the BBC's like response to Hill Street Blues was a big thing in the States and they had that wobbly cam kind of thing, which is the handheld stuff or, or the fast cuts camera, which had never been done here. This predates the bill. <clears throat> Only by a matter of months, I know, because they were filming in the same area as us. They were filming around the corner. I had a couple of mates in it. In fact, we used to call each other up and see what was on the caterers. 
<laughs> see who had the best, and we go to each one because it was all uniforms and all of that kind of going on. Um, and at one point, Paul was filming with Merle and I just around the corner. It was all filmed in uh, Notting Hill Gate, mm. and it was really well received. You know, Friday Night Drama and a chance for for me certainly to kind of you know to get a foothold in TV. The only bits and pieces I'd done I, I, already by then, I'd appeared in a couple of like bit parts in films. I was in Alan Blee's days film No Surrender. Uh, again, playing a copper, strangely enough, um, and a couple of other bits and pieces here and there, you know, sort of featured. But that was the first time I got to stay at a role, and and importantly, in those days, you know, sort of certainly with the BBC, they have focus groups and what have you, and they and, and they get the reaction of what who likes what character and if the audience like this and that. And I came across very favourably in fo focus groups. Who knew? Do you know what I mean? It's not not something I was trying to do. Again, more by luck than good judgment. Um, so I became one to watch, as it were, and started getting off in a little bit more. I mean, when I was doing that, Casualty started. And I was in the second or third ever episode of Casualty because the BBC liked to kind of put its so-called stars from, from one thing into another. So I went down to Casualty and did that. And so I, I started to get bits and pieces like that because of Rockcliffe's Baby. So that was the first. And it was the first time I started getting, you know, Radio Times covers, Face in the Paper, stories about this and that. I mean, already by then, my brothers and I had done a show called Yakety Yak, which was a musical uh, theatre. There's an interesting story about that. Again, look, I was auditioning, as I said, for Destry Rides again. I know for another play by the same director, another one where they needed uh, actor musicians. So I went along with my best thing, kind of stood on the stage, and I remember the director standing up in the audience saying, no, I don't want you for this. And I thought, OK. That's, at least that's nice feedback. He said, no, I'm doing another show. I'd like you for that. You know, you play, don't you? And, and your brother's Paul, isn't it? And I went, yeah, who's just, just out of RADA. I said, do you reckon he'd be interested in doing this? The idea was to do a, a musical based on the songs of Libra and Stoller. As it happened, the very next day, that, uh, or a couple of days later, my, our, our, we had the same agent then, or m m Paul Mark and myself had the same agent. They had to go, Marina Martin, darling, very, very like that. Um, and she was having a big 25-year party in Mayfair. And she'd asked my band, would, would I do the music? And I'd drafted Paul and Mark and Stephen in to do vocals, you know, because we all could do like all, all, all of this stuff. And when the director who, who came to the party saw all four of us there, he went, ah, why don't I have all four of them? So lo and behold, Stephen, from being in Liverpool, had never had a serious job. Got offered this job and, and an equity card and everything and kind of, came down on the train, started in the East End, and the show transferred to the West End. So we had a kind of a name. We were already, you know, we, Jack Tinker from the Daily Mail nominated us that year for the best newcomers in, in the Society of West End Awards. So we'd made a splash, you know, these, these four lads, you know, uh, like in, in, in this one show. Um, also at the time, uh, the series which became Bread, Carla Lane, a Carla Lane script arrived on our desk. All the old... All, I don't never know why they did this. They offered it to us individually. They never brought us in together and said, I think this would be a good idea. But we all four brothers got sent the script separately for this thing called Bread. And it was really weird reading it because the streets that were mentioned in the script were the streets outside the back of our house and the streets around by us in the Fithian Street and Farmworth Road. And, you know, didn't know who Carla Lane was at the time. Um, but we had a chat about it, the lads. Uh, and I and Paul had a burgeoning career. Mark, is, Mark was doing very well. He'd, he'd been playing Lennon at the, at the Everyman and gone to the West End. Uh, he and I had gone out on a tour of Blood Brothers, the very first tour of Blood Brothers. So he was, you know, he was flying high. And we all looked at each other and said, nah, it's not the time for us to do something together because, you know, we, we, like I said, we'd done Yak to Yak and we didn't want to be considered just an act, just like the fabulous Lion McGann brothers. We all wanted to be separate. So much to the surprise of the BBC, they thought we were joking, we all turned it down. And you know, it went on to be a very, very successful show and I don't regret for a day that you know, I didn't do it. Still get asked, were you in bread? Still get asked, you know, sort of, uh, uh, but no, we, we turned it down. So things were, were moving, we, we'd attracted attention. We'd, you know, we, we stuck out, we stuck our heads above the parrot, but we stuck out slightly from the crowd. And again, it's worth mentioning, remember, this is a time it's changed again, it's changed back again 
in these days, it's, you know, Dave Marcy's written about it, Al Steve's written about it, uh, Judy Dench has written about it, lots of people. There was a, there was a window in like, late 70s, early 80s, where working class, authentic people, because I think of, of, of the writers like Bleasdale, like Willie Russell, like you know, all of these writers that were writing urban, more relevant, more inner city kind of drama, we got the jobs. You know, so it, it was again a, a lucky break for us. So we, we got in, we got in through a gap into what is still now a very very middle class profession. We got we got into it. You know, it, it's harder these days. The doors closed again. I mean, it's you know drama schools these days tend to look more like finishing schools because they're the only people that can afford them. You know, um, are, you know are the middle class, and I, I, I say that with regret, but it's it, it's more true than not. So we we got through at a time where uh, there were jobs for us. You know, for, for, for all of these things, and, and, and we were able to kind of parlay that up into into doing some things which are a bit more varied. So after the first experience of Rockcliffe Babies, you've mm. got a burgeoning theatre mm. career mm. as well, mm. but it's always good to go back and do TV work that is repeat t TV work being being seized, and then you're offered some more. One hundred percent, yeah. I mean, sort of. There's, I got different bits. I was doing, um, I got a, like a semi-regular half a series in All Creatures Great and Small. I was playing a cowman, you know, full up to there in cow and all of that, you know, doing all of those things. Um, and I got a call from another producer who'd seen me at Sheffield, a guy called Christopher Walker. Uh, and Linda Bellingham, who was I was working with on... Uh, all Creatures, was a very, very dear friend of Diana Weston's. They went to college together, who I ended up in the upper hand with. And she was she told tale of, uh, Diana Weston was with Robert Lindsay, the actor, and she told tale of a, this guy, Christopher Walker, trying to, for the very first time, we, we'd had shows here, like Monty Python and stuff like that, which had gone and, to America and become an American format, like now it happens with The Office and stuff like that. But to, the, to date then, it had never been done the other way around. We'd never kind of taken an American format and made it British. And that's what this idea was. And my ears pricked up. And I, the reason I heard about it was because I'd heard that Robert Lindsay had turned it down. And I thought, I wonder if they're still looking for somebody. I knew Diana had it, and I knew that Honor Blackman was, was, was in the frame. And I thought, so I called Christopher Walker, who, who got me in for a couple of other things before. And I said, is that still the He said, so yeah, come down and audition for it. So I went and auditioned, and I, I met you know, I, Honor, and I did these scenes. And... Uh, I'll be completely honest, but one of the reasons I wanted it so much is because I knew what I sussed that I thought Robert Lindsay was foolish to turn down was the fact that if it worked, they had a load of scripts that they could make, and they could make in quick time. When you were doing comedies here, I'd already, or, or series here, I'd done things like The Gentle Touch and things like that, you know, episodes here, here, here and there. And what you were wait, what, when people I knew were in regular series, particular comedies, particularly comedies, the great comedy writers only used them six at a time. So you'd do six, and then you'd wait while they did, wrote the other six, and then you'd maybe do six more. I knew that you know, the, the, the upper hand had like 90-odd scripts. So if it worked, all they had to do was anglicize it, and hey, hey ho, the work was there. So I kind of tipped my hat at it, because I knew that if it, if it went, it would be a long job. Um, it wasn't for any other reason than that. It really it was, it was, it was the practicality. And uh, luckily, it was extremely well received, it, it, to, to be fair. you know. It, it came out of left field. Um, nobody knew that it was going to be a success. Like I say, the people had turned their nose up at it, like, like Bob Lindsay and a few others. And yet, from the moment it went on, it was, it was, it was a massive hit. And, and ITV used it to, to block everything else that was on. We literally did every night of the week, except Saturday and Sunday. They put us against whatever their power pool was, because we were getting, at one point, we were averaging 17, 18 million, you know, which is great, you know, it means you're a success and it means that like kind of, they still, even though they knew all of these scripts were there, they still made the mistake, which worked for me, of they would only book us for one series. And so when it came to the next series, they had to redo your fee, you know? And I said, how many scripts have you got yet? You sure you only want to book me that much? Okay, you know, and so, I actually did very well out of it. I did, you know, we ended up doing 102 episodes. We actually exceeded, uh, the American, um, the original American product, and outsold it in every territory. You know, uh, and I was offered a job by Columbia TriStar. That's a, that's a kind of whole other story. I, I went to LA and 
at a time in my life. Let, let's not yeah. go into LA yeah. yet, let's, because yeah. we've, we've got, a, yeah. got a clip from the upper hand. Now I just need to signal to producer Tom up there. That's the that's the, one of the ones on the the IMDb that we're going to stream live. Uh, if you can if you manage that, Tom. Got it. It's a uh, it no pressure, be, Tom. It must be a clip from from the first first episode, I think, because it kind of sets up the uh, yeah. set, sets up the, the the situation for the for the for the sitcom. Let's see if let's see if we've got this. So that the upper hand really established you. By it did. That. I mean, it was one of those gifts. It, it was an absolute oh, gift. What you're being asked to do. Hamilton phone. Oh, good. Not that much of a gift, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things that well, it, it, I figured that you give it your all. I mean, you're being asked. It's the, the, the strangest character brief I've ever had in many ways, and to play the perfect man. You know, like the man who look after the kids. He, he lifts the sofa, he, he cleans under the sofa, he, he can cook, he can wash, he can sew, you know, all of these things. So it, it was kind of irresistible to, to, to try and create a believable character in that. But then the audiences loved it. It was, you know, it was an established, they were established, they were established in the States and we knew what to do with it here. We had great people in the cast. And once we knew it, it hit. It was amazing. So we got we got to we got really really good at it. We we got very very good at it. And what we tried to do, you're on a sitcom set which is long, you know. So sort of all, all all the cameras are going in front of it. So classically, you've got living room, kitchen, bedrooms, and then a another set. You might be going out to I don't know some club or blah blah blah. And that's how it was. So the cameras are all there. So we got to know basically how they shot it. And we got to we got to know our characters so well that we we'd rehearse it and we do we perform them like plays. But there was always a live audience in there, and we were trying and succeeded like 40, 50 percent of the time to do it, Act One as 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 rehearsed so that they would get it and all the cameras would be running around and we we'd get it as one thing, and then Part Two would all be, all be live, and the audience reaction would be in there. We very rarely had to go back and do retakes. We just got very very good at it, and it, that was a great pleasure. And yeah, you know, it, 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 it kind of it put paid to my drama career for a while, uh, as these things do. All I got offered for, in fact, after that, when I, did, when I said I didn't want to do any more, they offered me Married with Children, which was another American comedy they wanted to make over here, which Ross Abbott ended up doing. I said, no, I didn't want to do it. And two or three others had the same kind of thing. But television-wise, drama jobs just dried up. Because like now, apparently, I was, a, I was in comedy. Who, who knew, where, whereas before I'd been. Um, but that's where theatre comes in handy. That's where you know, I was able to kind of carry on doing things I loved. And, and also, you know, I'd made a few quid by then. And it, it was a strange time, because it was that time. Rockcliffe's Babies, I had uh, you know, been in the papers, started getting recognised on the street and, and things like that, which is weird. When the upper hand hit, I, I, I stacked it basically. I, I, I completely lost all anonymity. I couldn't travel on the tube to work anymore because they were all there. I, I didn't know that it was going to be like that for me, but it kind of it, it came on top, and I kind of span out a little. I, all the attention, and strange things started happening, which I know now was my phone being hacked. You know, you don't find that out at the time. All of this kind of stuff. They, they you know that. I, Every when I was doing theatre jobs in between series and stuff like that, every leading lady I had, I was supposed to be having an affair with, and and all of this and so the, all of this unwarranted attention spanned me out and and I kind of re retreated uh, as much as you can while still kind of trying to earn a living. I I I, I concentrated on running a production company uh, for quite some time, still auditioning for the odd job that came in, but turning down all the comedies because I didn't just want to be known for that. You know I. I I was blessed that I was able to, until a divorce anyway, I still had a few quid. Um, and, but it, it, it was at one time it, it, in my career, you know, there I was all over the place, the envy of everybody else, but in myself, I felt wretched. I just, it was a very, very bad time for me mentally. Uh, I started drinking too much. I started like self-medicating, those kind of things. So while, you know, I, I, and it sounds horrible. I understand why when people say to you, what's the matter with you? You know what I mean? You say, oh, well, you know, I'm not. What have you got to worry about? You know, you're all, you're all over the telly. You know, you're earning all this money. But that only compounds the problem. And it took me, you know, it's, it's, 
it, I'm not the only person it's ever happened to. Um, but it took me a while to kind of get back on, on track with myself after that. And I kind of realized that I needed to kind of do a, do a few things to protect myself from all of that falseness. I loved the job. I mean, Robert Downey Jr. said a little while ago, didn't he? He said he acts for nothing. He says he takes the big bucks for all of the rest of the shit, as he put it, that goes with it. And I kind of get what he means. You know, it, it, it's a job I love and I love the work, but all the, the rest of the attendant stuff, I find pulling teeth, you know. So having once upon a time thought of going to train to be a butler, yeah, you then end up being making, a housekeeper. Being a, being a house, That's a, the irony. It's, it's, it's funny, isn't it? I remember, I remember telling the, the producer, I don't think he believed me. I remember back in the day, oh, yeah, I want to be, yeah, okay, that's a little bit too desperate, you know what I mean? But, but it's the truth. Yeah, these, these ironies, you know, playing this perfect man, like I say, you know, I did the fan mail I used to get was ridiculous, oh, you can come around and do my ironing any time, you know, all of this. And, it, yeah, he, you know, the perfect man like that doesn't exist. But there he was. And I suppose it also marks the last of... During the upper hand, of course, we went from having just four channels, four or five channels, we went to, like, cable started, various different things, so lots and lots, and lots of different things come in, and genres got split. The upper hand was a show that all the family watched, uh, and that's not, we don't have that anymore, really. You know, they've split it all up into genres, you know, one will watch the in-between, as one, you know, someone will watch the older, and it's made like that, you know, because we need, we, there's so much content now that it's, it's, it's targeted at niche audiences. I mean, I'm doing Hollyoaks at the moment, you know, sort of, it's not something I've watched, I'm not its target audience, but it's good for Channel 4 because it, I think it, it averages a regular 2 million, stuff like that, which is a long way down from 18 million, which the upper hand was getting, you know, but still it's regular because that's how much it's all been split up now and it's, and it's all about niche, you know, sort of, so I'm, I'm, I'm very proud, I'm very proud of it, but I remember it, like I say, in a bittersweet way. I mean, I, was, I, I wasn't in the best of places all the time when I was doing it. You're in Hollyoaks just now, mm -hmm. but you've had experience in soaps I, before. As I have. With yeah. that night and day. Yeah, back in 2002, 2001, no, 2000, 2001. Uh, great writer, TV writer, who I'd, I'd, I'd actually worked with developing one of his scripts with my production company, a guy called Caleb Ranson, said that ITV had had this idea to do a, a real proper, like, grown-up soap. Okay. And they wanted to make it a little bit more filmic so they, they would have a fantasy kind of element to it like kind of pushing that you know the, a slightly kind of surreal element to it to make it more for the grown-ups so granada in their wisdom commissioned night and day uh which i worked with lizette anthony who's who's now in in uh hollyoaks as well um and we set to work in three mills island to on this these really really good scripts these really good ideas i was playing a character with like sides you know he was a guy who was having an affair with a 15, 16 year old girl. So, you know, not great on the one hand, but he was a good father and husband. So, you know, ambivalent characters and, and the storylines were interesting. There was Leslie Joseph, Gareth Hunt, blah, 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 blah. The great and the good, you know, they, they put a load of us together. Um, about six months into it, Granada lost a load of money on, they had a thing called on digital. They, 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 they lost, like a fortune and so what they did is they pulled back all the money that they were putting into drama they pulled back all the contingencies which meant there was no like room for error in any of the things and they decided to cut short what they they'd said they'd deliver two years at least to the, to the network so they crammed it into a year they kept our contract to a year and so I, I think I worked until I got injured I worked about nine months straight without a day off uh, while they were trying to do this and all around people were leaving because literally they weren't building sets properly. They were filling holes in storylines because they were just, you know, um, getting people to, to read stuff straight to camera and things like this, which is kind of fitted into the fantasy element. But for an actor, you just think, what's going on here? We, we, we can see that this is dying a death or, you know, on the thing. So it was, it was, it was difficult, but strangely enough, it became a big hit in Australia. It got me to Australia for a job one time. You know, I got a job over there because of night and day. And it's still online because people go online about the chat rooms, about everything. There, um, there are people who are still fans of night and day. It was a worthy attempt. It, was a re it really was a worthy attempt and some great actors in it. And single camera, 
good writer, good production values until they started leading all the money back. And yeah, a happy job. We've got a clip of we've, uh -huh. got, a, we've got a clip from from Night, night and Day, mm -hmm. Tom. If we go back to the the not the IMDb stuff, the the other list of clips. The next one we've, 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 we've got, and this is a, a scene with you and uh, Lizette uh, Anthony. Ah, bless and you, I think you see the the sense of the fantasy element in it as well <laughs> in the end of this clip. It's not quite EastEnders, is it? Not quite La La Land either, <laughs> is it? You know, but um, but you know, it was a valiant attempt. It was I I, I very much enjoyed it, and I, I made some great friends in it. You know, uh, but what? I, I was there when I, I remember watching all of a sudden um, the cameraman. We were filming in, in Three Mill Studios in East in East End of London, and one of the cameramen who who, who wasn't working had his monitor on, and first planes went into 9/11. It was 9-11, and so we, we were working there. I remember, I remember for that all kind of work stopped that day and, and watching the news break on the telly while we were in our little soap bubble, you know. Uh, it was just yeah, strange, strange things you remember. Boring as well, I suppose. Isn't it? Uh, um, but no, it, it, was, it, was a, it was a good job again, you know, sort of... Uh, it was my, like I say, first drama I'd been offered for a long time, you know, uh, after the upper hand. And so I was pleased to do it. And the, the producer still gives me work now, Damien Timmer. Thank you. Um, and it, you know, it, it, it kind of it, it went missing here, and it was much derided here. But like I say, it was a hit elsewhere. You know, not everything you do can be well received. But so, I was going to ask you, how after the upper hand, mm. after the experiences you've had of fame, mm. and you've gone away and run your production company, mm -hmm. how did you bring yourself back? I, I, I discovered that there's a lot of guff spoken about this job, especially by people in it, and kind of ways of being. You don't. I've learned that you don't have to play that game. You know what was always like I said as a kid. What I saw was a job. I just went back to that. I went back to treating it as a job, more as a job, and not as like kind of this thing that just takes over your life. And the fact that other people, you know, it is strange, and it never gets normal. You know, to, that people go, oh, it's you, and grab you and say, look who it is. You know, like you can't hear. People think celebrities or people have to tell you can't hear because they're in your living rooms. That, that's weird, weird sometimes, but it's part and parcel of it. It goes, I like the job. I like the people who do the job uh, almost invariably. Actors get a bad press, I think, for the most part. You know, so sort of if, you know, people say, oh, what do you do at a party? Do you know what I mean? And you say actor, they tend to step back. A little bit in case they're going to be either bored to death or talk to death or some kind of drunken molestation goes on. Do you know what I mean? Sort of this idea of the rampant ego, you know, the attention seeking, that kind of stuff. Of course they exist, they ex exist in any job. But people who've been in my job for a long time become partly inured to all, all of that stuff, but partly by choice they are the most pragmatic and sensible and well adjusted people that I've ever met. So I just went back amongst those and just stopped reading the publicity. I was doing a show. Uh, I came up here to do a show for, for, for one, just between the last two series, I think it was, of, of The Upper Hand. Ken Wright called me up. All right, Joe. Uh, listen, the, you know, the, the playhouse is going to go dark. Will you come up and do something for Equity Minimum? And I said, yeah, fine. And I'd love to. You know, so I love the playhouse and stuff. And, and he said, oh, well, we'll do one of Willie's plays. I said, well, with respect, I said, because I, I know Willie as well, and I, I said, they've been done. I said, if I'm going to come up and do something for equity minimum, and I'm going to, I'm going to guarantee you five weeks, you know, probably filling it because I was a big name then and all of that. Uh, can we do something new? So he said, are you sure? And so he, I said, you must have something being the big producer you are. So he sent me three plays, and the one I picked was a one man show, and it was brilliant, and it was lovely, and and. He said, really? And it was about a guy who gets accused of sexually molesting his own kids. He didn't do it. But the whole of the drama, the whole of the play, the audience aren't sure. And so this one man show, I came, I came and it was funny. A guy, guy called Dennis Lumborg wrote it. Really, really, really funny and really touching and really searing. And a big hit um, in, uh, at the Playhouse and transferred into the West End. I don't know whether you remember when Stephen Fry left Cellmates uh, mm -hmm. because of depression mm -hmm. strength. Well, it did me a favour because that theatre became free. <laughs> and I, I literally, I moved, he left on the Friday. We were in on the Tuesday. 
you know, sort of I finished the, uh, uh, and so again, fated, I was sitting in my dressing room in the West End. Uh, there were great reviews for this part. It was a really, really lovely play and a gift of a play to do. Really brilliant reviews. It's, I was reading Time Out magazine and in the front of it, was my picture was on the front and, and, and great. There's a review inside. It was like my mum wrote it. You know what I mean? It was that, it was that glowing. And then on, in the back, under the television section, in the review of the upper hand, it said I couldn't walk and act at the same time. That's what it actually said. So and I remember thinking, and I've still got it in my memorabilia, it's the same magazine. And that tells you all you need to know about kind of, or told me all I needed to know about that game, you know, and, and not trying to pander to whatever people think out there. It's fine. In fact, I went through, <laughs> I went through a phase of positively playing with it. I just openly used to, when people wanted to know things, I just used to completely fabricate them. Just to make things up and see how far it went. And, and, and things like when I was filling in, um, because you realize how much of a nonsense it is. When I was filling in, it, if you, when you go to the theater, you see in the program, there's always a kind of precy of your career. I used to invent one or two parts, like things that were entirely fictitious. Mm -hmm. Me and a few mates did it, and, and our lads, our, the brothers, we all did it. Because you get fan letters saying, oh, I loved you in so-and-so. One of these things you'd invented. Or you get people, producers saying, oh, I saw you in that, and you think, okay. And you'd know what it was. So I, I, I learned a healthy distance. I learned to keep a healthy distance between all of that, that side of things, the fame side of things, and what I loved, which is the work, and I still do. Um, I remember my daughter despairing. One time I was, I was looking after her in, 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 in her flat. I was, I was staying there with her, and a phone call came through. I used to turn down celebrity stuff across the board. And I was on the phone one day, and Celebrity Weakest Link had came, come through for me and said, oh, will you do it? And I said, Celebrity Weakest Link? And Lottie, my daughter, was next to me. She went, oh, Dad, go on. I just wanted to say, so, OK, I'll do it. You know, so I went and did it, and, and, and that was good. And then, for similar reasons, a little while later, you know, sort of uh, MasterChef came through, Celebrity MasterChef came through. But for other reasons, I took that. Uh, and that, boldly honest, I was skint. Uh, m my wife had had a, a situation where she got us, well, not by any fault of her own, but company, she got into a big debt, and of course, I got married to they came for me, and it cleaned me out. It absolutely cleaned me out, and I didn't know where the next money was coming from. And the thing about Celebrity Master Show is the more episodes you get, the more pay you get. Here's the thing. Here, here's, here's, here's what my game is like. I remember, I remember when there was, I, I was auditioning, I'd auditioned for Doctors, which was on BBC Two at the time. And so was MasterChef. And they were auditioning, they, they were negotiating. Now, the same people negotiate both parts, the bookers negotiate both parts. Even with then 15 years or whatever experience, I was getting offered, I think, about a grand, which was the top like kind of guest star for two weeks in casualty. For being a celebrity who they didn't even know could cook, I was being offered five times as much. So. You think to yourself, it's not experience, or is it just the fact that I'm that fella off the telly? So, you know, you start to kind of, if you let it, you can get a jaw on this die about these things, but, it, but it's a fair indicator of how the business has changed. We've actually got a clip of Celebrity Master, master, <laughs> master Show. I'm going to be careful what I say. No, no. It was that porn film I did as well. You know? Yeah. I don't know, Tom, if you can line this up for us. It was, it was the last one on the list. I was actually going to show it, show it last, but this would seem a good time to show it and actually showcase your skills as a... As I still a, get to me into trouble, this. As a chef. Uh, I'm not cooking for you. You've been on Celebrity mm. Master Show. Can't make mashed potato, clearly. Sure, <laughs> sure. Uh, no, it, it's. I tell you what, it's, it's, it, I, I, I kind of my eyes open there. That's a real high pressure job, that one, because I, I, I was in the last episode of the, se of, 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 of the series or the last, the last intake, and while you're there doing like the, the, the blind challenge and stuff like that, they come to you and say, okay, if you make it through to the next round, what are you going to cook? And you have to commit to it. And, and because where I was, I would, I'd be coming in the next day. And the next day and stuff like that, so you have to kind of carry on doing it. So it's it's high pressured, you know, and, and uh, but very enjoyable. Greg Wallace, I don't care if I never see again. I don't mind telling you that. <laughs> but the other fellow, John Tarod, uh nice man. A little story. I, I would I, some friends of mine were in from the states and big foodies, and they wanted to go to St John, his restaurant in the East End of London. I went down there with them. They wanted some nice. You know, English can't do steaks. Apparently, they were all on at me like that. So I, I took them there. 
And John saw me in there this six, seven months after I'd done the show. Oh, hello, Joe, how are you doing? You know, sort of, and so sitting around the table, took all our orders and said, come on. And he took me into the kitchen, so I cooked my mates the meat for my mates in, in his kitchen. So that was really nice. He's a nice fellow. He, he taught me, a, you know, a few things, which I, I still taught me how to properly chop an onion and things, you know, and, and how, to, how, to, how to open a garlic every time, you know what I mean? So he, he, he's nice. Greg Wallace is a little bit unfortunate. I'll just let's leave it there, you know. You know. We'll draw a veil over, over Greg, Greg Wallace. Yeah. I want to have a look at something that I think lots of people will know you, know you from. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's you as a comic mm -hmm. actor. And uh, if, we've got, if we could line up the, the Harry Enfield sketch, which uh, if we can, we're not actually, we're technically not in Liverpool, we're in the borders of, mm -hmm. of Liverpool city region. So I think we can get away with screening, uh, screening, screening this. Um, Sketch from Harry Enfield. That came about, though, they came about. I was doing um, a thing with Harry Enfield. It was like a spoof South, South Bank show. I knew Harry, we'd, we'd done a couple of other things before. And, and a thing called Norbert Smith, A Life, which was lovely, like, a, you know, it was great. And I was playing this Albert Finney character in like the black and white days. And we were waiting for this street to be kind of gone, gone down back into period. And me, Harry, Paul Whitehouse, and Gary Bleasdale were sitting in, in this trailer talking about Brookside and how, like, Harry, Harry was, like, kind of asking us about Scouse Saxon because he patently can't do one and he still can't. Um, and, he, and he said, but have you noticed on Brookside, you know, like, kind of, there's always someone calm down, there's always, like, it's going up and going down, going up and going down, like, like, like this. And we were having a laugh with it that day. It cut to a couple of months later, I'm back rehearsing the upper hand, uh, the next series of the upper hand, and I got a phone call at rehearsals. No mobiles then. Or oh, they were, but they were that big. Um, and he said, do you remember what we were doing? Because he, he, they'd been given a show and they'd run out of stuff. He said, I've got nothing left on the disc. Do you remember we were playing around with that Scouser's idea? He said, would he come over and do it? So I went over to Wembley Studios in the afternoon and we sat there with Ian Hislop, of all people, who kind of collate, collated the ideas together. And he said, okay, we've got the ideas and we, we improvised it. And we first put that sketch in front of an audience of his show that he, he already had um, Wayne and Wayneta and Tim Nice But Dim. And, and these other characters, and they got quite a good response in front of the audience. Came, came to the Scousers, nothing. Absolutely nothing. Nobody got it. Nobody got it. So Harry kind of went, oh, like this. We were dying behind the screen. So he went out and explained the premise. And when we came back out and had to do it again, and these sort of people were laughing and stuff like that. But then, cut to like the week after, again, the focus groups, and they were the most popular. Sketch. And I was a bit, I was a bit worried because it was, it was taking the Mickey out of Brookside, not out of Liverpool, but. They're, they're all, 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 the, all the people. And I was worried about how it would be received here. I needn't have worried. Because I turned up for the first game of the season. We got season tickets for Anfield. I turned up for the first game of the season wondering what was going on. Everybody all down our row had the curly wigs on and moustaches <laughs> going, all right, lads, all right. You know, like this, so I thought, that's all right. You know, so it kind of stayed. Mm -hmm. But uh, that, that catchphrase, which we came up with on that afternoon, hey, 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 calm down, all of that. It stuck with me. I get people still like build this shot and they're out of bounds. Hey lads, calm down. You got a wanker. No, that, 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 <laughs> that kind of thing. But, um, it's it's yeah. It's it's funny. You, you never know what sticks. You know. You talked before about when you were in Yakety Yak and you didn't want to be the Fly McGann brothers and you all went your separate ways. You come back much later mm -hmm. to make the hanging the hanging gale. Well, that was all going on. We were trying to get it made or like during most of the upper hand. Stephen and I were in Kerry. We, we were trying to trace where our family tree come from. And if you, if you know anything about genealogy, you know that Dublin, the records burnt down in Dublin in 1870. So to get anything before that, you have to go to the parishes, find out where it is. There's no central record. So we're chasing this and we kept seeing eyewitness accounts of the famine. And we realized, possibly by being one step removed, like by, you know, by, by being English, S Stephen and I had this kind of Damascene moment one night. We said, this has never been treated on film. It's, we've never seen, we, we know the stories by second hand. We've seen now them written. So Stephen and I sat up with a bottle of pochine, like kind of most of one weekend, and just wrote down a treatment because we were excited and we thought, well, if we use all, we, we, we called the lads back in England, said, if we put something together, would, would you put your names to it? And they went, yeah, in principle, yeah. Uh, and we sat, sat and wrote the idea that it would be about a family, that it would be like upsetting the famine and stuff like this. And, and we, when we flew back from 
from Dingle to London, we got a, a meeting with Michael Waring on the Monday or the Tuesday. And he commissioned it on the spot. He just said, yeah, great idea, commissioned it. Which then led to a six years of wrangling because people were feared that it was giving us too much power. W one thing I knew by running my production company was I knew that the BBC had to start taking independent commissions, co-productions. Co I also knew that in Ireland, because I was making something there, that there was a Section 22 tax agreement, which was great for production. You got, you got your money off the production. Put the two of those together, and the BBC doing an independent co-production in Ireland was irresistible. But of course, it put the, put the, the nose out of joint of the leader of BBC Northern Ireland, a guy called Robert Cooper, who was sniffy about the whole idea, probably because he hadn't had the idea himself. You know, and, and careerists being careerists, they're loath to take anything that's not their own baby. Anyway. Six years later, we got it made, and we wanted it. We, we realized they'd never let me and Steve write it. We did ask. They said no. But we went and found a guy called Alan Cubitt, who's since gone on to write things like The Fall and, and Thin Blue Lion and stuff like this. He, he's a really, really good writer. We, we commissioned him to do it, and he wrote a great script. It's not easy to watch uh, because we stuck true to it. It's not about the fabulous Fly and McGann brothers. We play the feelings in it, a family who are absolutely torn apart, like Ireland was torn apart at the time. And... It's probably the thing in my career I'm most proud of because it, it took us so long to get it made and it's so authentic. The BBC won't show it again. They showed it once because our deal is too good. They'd have to pay us too much money. Um, that's a fact. Uh, but it gets shown across the United States every St. Patrick's weekend on Bravo. And in Ireland, they actually show it in schools to teach them about the famine. So very, very proud of it. Really, really, very proud of it. Let's watch a clip of you and the, the Hanging Gale. That's another one of the IMD B clips, Tom. That's the. You'll be pleased to hear the last of the IMDb <laughs> B clips if we manage to get the sound of this one to work. Here we go. Nothing. We, we were in, hunting in the wrong place, as it turns out. We we, we eventually found we were from Ross Common, uh, but like, it, you know, we we were really looking around. We were staying in uh, some friends of ours' places out, out there. It's, Actually, two casting directors, uh, John and Lars Hubbard, were staying in their place. I mean, they heard about it and, 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 and things like that. But what I learned about the McGanns, I mean, because it, during the filming of it and everything, as you imagine, it was quite harrowing. And, and, and we employed most of Irish equity as well, you know, so, so they were th quite thankful. We were invited back this year. It's 25 years ago since this, this, it was this summer since we shot it. Jesus. Um, and also coincided with Remelton, the town where we based our, uh, in, in, in County Donegal, where we based our production, where, where we were thinking. Of course, if the budget for the series is about five, six million, uh, we put a million and a half into the local economy. So, as they say in Ireland, a mile of good favour goes before us, you know. And they invited us back there, and we all went as a family to kind of, to the Lennon Festival, which is the River Lennon, which runs through Remelton. They did, that was their 50th festival this year. And it was great to walk in and see, and, and how many, all the, all the local people had brought in their own kind of memorabilia, this, this, this like the local hall. And it was amazing to see how many people we'd touched. Not only that, but you know, sort of, when you get letters in the Times and the Irish Times of like kind of people saying, why did it take like kind of four English lads to remind us of our own history? And there were questions asked in the house about like kind of, is there a collective shame about the famine and stuff like that? There was just a sense of doing something really, really good and big and being able to follow the whole process right through, even if they thought the lunatics were taking over the asylum, you know, at, at some time. Um, it was great. You know, we won awards as producers. Um, before I ever won an award as an actor, I won an award as a producer, so that's strange. But still very, very proud of it. At the end of it, we, we were all sick of each other again as a family. We didn't want to work together for a while. Unless, I think, oh, Paul said, unless you come up with something which is four beach bums in Barbados, I'm not doing it. <laughs> um, and so we all went our separate ways. Um, we were asked, strangely enough, just recently, we would, would we consider doing something again? And we thought, the right idea, yeah, why not? Because it's an obvious sell. It's an obvious selling point, and, and people leap on that. Um, but we made something good there, and we, we kept a hand on it we, right the way through all, the, all of the process. We didn't give away our rights to it until it, it was done the way we wanted to do. So it was a labor of love and, you know, very nearly tore us all apart, you know, in fighting and, and things like that, but immensely proud of it, immensely proud of it. And it was the very first, it was the first historical drama the BBC made at the French had bought in their history. 
because the French are very sniffy about that. Mm. You know, the French are very sniffy about, no, we make historical drama, you do not. Um, but they took this one, and the BBC were, were, were amazed. They, took us, they, they flew us down to, to the Cannes TV and Film Festival, MIPCOM, and put us up at the Hotel Eden Rock. Never seen the like of it. I mean, it's all you're doing is selling the TV series, you know what I mean? So if they'd have used some of that, they could have paid a couple of actors, you know what I mean, to the book. It was, it was nice. It was nice to see that side of things. And I know that don't have to do it again. You know, um, I, leave, I leave that the production side to other people. So one of the things you're well known for mm -hmm. is that relationship with your brothers. Yeah. The other is with Liverpool. Mm -hmm. And I want, the last clip I want to show is of the Liverpool nativity and your part in that, which showcases your skills as a, in musical theatre. Oh God! So let's, 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 let's if you haven't if you haven't seen this before, let's have a let's have a look, look at look at this. The idea of the, the 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 Liverpool nativity is it takes the music of the city uh, to tell tell tell. It was the, all live. It was filmed live as well. Yeah, yeah, it was all filmed live. It's like fifty cameras over three hours through the centre of Liverpool, and there was a Liverpool game on Liverpool United. You know, mad. That, that was a that was a really interesting day actually. Noreen Kershaw, uh, it was who asked me to come come and do that. Uh, I was I can't remember. I was in theatre somewhere. They got me off for a couple of days, um, and they were worried because they realised they'd scheduled it up against one of the busy days of Liverpool United playing. And Liverpool won. Um, but they were worried about the crowds coming into town afterwards because we we were desperate to finish on on a live shoot, of course this sense of impending, like this whole machine is rolling towards you. You know, we, 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 we'd done something inside St. George's Hall and then shoot, shot out to be, to be on the stage at the back of St. George's Hall. And you could feel this thing all getting there and it all had to be, you know, at, at the right time. Um, we got it. And, but then they were worried about people getting away from it and, and the camera and all of this, because all the football crowds came into town. They needn't have worried because the whole crowd started, there's only one baby Jesus. There's only one baby Jesus. And it just starts the whole thing. And it, it, that's what, you know, it, it makes Liverpool a, a, a great place to do these kind of things. You know, it was, it was, yeah, it was a really good day, that. Yeah. And you've got a long way around to come back to Liverpool now. Because mm, yeah. what you're going to do for the next couple of years is Hollyoaks. It's Hollyoaks, yeah. I was actually, you never can tell. I, I, in a couple of weeks, this will be the longest I've spent in Liverpool since 1976 when I left. Uh, I've come up and done plays, I've come up and done you know, TV jobs, but nothing f f like now for, like, it'll be 12 weeks in, in, a, you know, in, in a moment. Um, not that I'd avoided it, it's just you go where, where the work is. You, know, you absolutely go where the work is. And I was about to move to Glasgow again, I'd, I'd lived there before. And I'm well connected up there. I, I did live TV. I, I, I've got a presenting thing going on up there, and I'm in with the theatres. And I thought, because I, my friend and I bought a farm in Wales. We, I've, I've been living on the side of a hill, out in the quiet, so, you know, a way where the paparazzi can't find you. Um, and I just thought I needed to kind of come into off the hill a little bit. So I was going to go to Glasgow. How do you make God laugh? You tell him your plans. Um, and the next thing I got offered uh, this, and it, it's a really interesting character to play a. Play a bad guy again. Play another. Play a surgeon. My mum's chuffed. There's like three doctors in the family at the minute. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, it's, it's it's four if you count Doctor Who. Um, it's and and so it's it, it, it's funny, you know. And and I, I kind of a, a set of circumstances. I, I find myself living. I've, I've got a house in Gattaca, um, which I'm renting at the moment. But I think I'm going to buy. I'm going to move my mum up in, in with me because she's not too well. Or she's, you know, she's all right, but she just need, needs a bit of help. So she's going to come back to Liverpool. She's been living in Salisbury. So where I am at the moment, I've worked out the other day. I'm half a mile from work, which is great. I've never been so close to work. Half a mile from the school I got expelled from, SFX. Half a mile from the pub I had first had a drink in. And half a mile from my first girlfriend, where I discovered sex and drugs and rock and roll. Do you know what I mean? Sort of all of that. So I'm in this kind of strange axis of old timelines. But because I didn't plan it, it feels so welcoming and so right and so just joyous to be in Liverpool just now. You know, I've, I, the, the last thing I did, I was here for any amount of time, I did a, the new play at the New Everyman, the first new play there called um, Hope Place. And that was great. That was, you know, great to be back. And, and, and I, I still come back when I, when I can get to the game. Um, but so much is happening here at the moment. There's like six or seven professional stages. There's this and that. And, 
And like I say, not asking for it, it, it coming by surprise, it's, it's, it's been a pleasant surprise. You know, that I, and there's, it's, it's funny in a roundabout way, you know what I mean, but, but, but a lad from Kenny to end up with a house in Gattaca. Seems like I've made it, you know what I mean? It's like, it, well, it does, doesn't it? But what else am I going to measure it to? Do you know what I mean? I feel like, yeah, it's just we are eBay, matey. Do you know what I mean? So it feels good. You know, I've kind of gone up in the world by a circuitous route, but I've, I've, I've ended up in Gattaca. You know? That's a fortuitous moment, I think, to, for me to stop hogging the, hogging, hogging Joan asking questions. And let's, let's see if we've got some questions Come in on, the- be brave. In, in the audience. Yeah, yeah. Do we have a, do we have a, a mic? Or are we gonna- We'll, we'll hear you. We do have a mic, so use, you, wait, wait for the mic to come. He wants to ask, ask you a question. Yes, okay. Just, just wait for the mic. There's get, a mic there, get, look. Gets, gets I, I Thank you. Yeah. I, uh, no, use, use the mic for... What do you think separates a, a good actor from an, an excellent actor? Good question. Listening. Listening more than anything else. I mean, it's all very well learning your lines. It's all very well saying your lines in the right place. But unless you're reacting authentically, unless you're, you're in the moment, in the place, it's listening. That it, it, people, people don't often realise it, you know. It's a funny, it's a strange art form, isn't it? It's unlike a musician or a painter or stuff like that. If an actor can't practice on his own. You can learn your lines, which is a, just a slog. It never, you know, it's, it's, that's how it is. But until you get with somebody else, you're not really doing it. And whether that somebody else is another actor, whether it's an audience, whether it's a director, you know, it, it needs to be there. But it's listening and, and like being there, being present. You know, even in something you've done every day for a year, you know, sometimes twice a day, still be there in the present. That's that's the difference for me. You know, you always believe then what, you know, why it comes. I heard acting described years and years and years ago, and I've always thought it was one of the best kind of little potted ways of doing it. Somebody, I think it was, um, I can't remember his name now, an old older actor, Freddie Frinton. He, he used to play the best drunk, like in in the world. And he said, well, that's what acting is. He said, like, and you ask somebody who doesn't know about acting to play a drunk, and they'll play somebody being drunk. So if you ask an actor to do it, they'll play somebody trying to be sober. Because that's what you do when you're drunk. You're trying to be sober. And that's the difference. And it's a very, very thin thing. But that and listening are, are, are what make it fly. You know, good question. Let's see. We've got another question. Where'd you get your boots, Joe? Come on. Any, anything will do. I want to hear about this £15,000 suit that you bought. We've got, <laughs> we've got, we've got another, another question there. I hope this isn't an unfair question, but you said very much at the beginning how much those opportunities when you were younger have mm. helped with mm. social mobility. And I just wondered what you thought about what's going on these days and the lack of opportunities for younger people. I think it's a perennial problem. I think it's, you know, the, the lack of opportunities. But it's also the way that people approach it. Um, I'm the lead patron of a drama school in town called Rare Studios, and I'm very, very proud of what we're doing there. It's means tested, you know, sort of, which means that people are in there based on ability, not ability to pay. And in Just that, I mean, is not the norm. I mean, so there's, there's, there's us and maybe two others in the whole country wide which, which, which take this talent, which is here. But then we're living in the X Factor generation, the, 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 the generation whereby received information now, it's like all you've got to do to kind of get into this thing is want it enough. There's nothing more poisonous. There's nothing, you know, that, that is just, if, if you're wanting stuff so much, you're missing stuff that you need. I spend a lot of time disabusing people that like kind of that desire, that want, it's not your friend. Like adrenaline is not your friend. Do you know what I mean? It's, it, it, it serves a purpose, and, and you get it, get, want to do it. The way things are closing now, I don't see it changing. I can't see it changing. Um, but but the reality is, the opportunities are still there. You just got to go a different way about getting them. And people ask me all the time, you know, what you know, what would you say to my daughter or my son wants to be. A, be an actor, what, I, I, they say to me, what, what advice would you give them? I say, get a degree first. Go and get something else first. Because that's the reality of how hard it is out there. I mean, I've been more than blessed and very, very lucky. Most, most of it is luck. I mean, yes, you have to kind of be able to turn, you know, you have, you have to be able to deliver 
once you've had the slice of luck. But social mobility, I don't know. I mean, sort of here we are in you know here we are in a country where the worst, the people who are, are going to suffer the worst are revering people who are the worst of the posh. You know, without naming names, you know, because I don't want to get into that. But whilst we live in a society that reveres that posh, then we're in trouble. Because I, be, I was doing the show last year um, with a lovely friend of mine, Charlie Hardwick, who used to be an Emma Deb. We were doing Sting's musical. Sorry, drop the name. So we're doing Sting's musical. We're working with Sting, and one of the things that it was about his his background in Wall's End, playing Geordies, playing these people who worked in the shipyards. And it hadn't worked on Broadway, and so they got in a, a writer, a Scottish writer called Lauren Campbell, to redo the script. And he, even though he's like kind of a happening on, on, on the money guy, while, while we were in rehearsals trying to rehearse this new script, we have to kept up the same thing. Look, what are you doing? You know, working class people can be clever, rounded. You don't have to use all of these tropes. I mean, he wasn't wasn't quite whippets and flat caps, but it was all of those tropes of what a working class person is. I remember, you know, sort of. Like my uncles, who were experts in the strangest things, you know, autodidact, self-taught, you know, and they and and they, they used to pride themselves. This this thing I heard a lot as a kid, you know, you can talk, both talk to both a beggar and a king. So the idea of social mob mobility was romantic; it was there, but in reality, you didn't really get to mix much. There was a, a little bit of a time. Who knows? Look, history is cyclical. Maybe it'll come round again. What I think of things at the moment is. There are various various things which don't work for me. You look if you look at the soaps, for instance. Let's not talk about class for a second. But let's talk about body image, for instance. I mean, you'd think that everybody in Walford, right, or the East End, like had a six pack, permatan, and shiny white teeth. They seem to be selecting from a very small pool of how people look, and this is supposed to be normal everyday people. I mean, East End is probably not the best example, but you know what I mean. It, 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 there's, there's a narrow eyes for the, for, for the people that are making these things. The actors are always the last to be paid for anyway. And what they want to see is that eight times out of ten, well-intentioned, they'll talk down to their audience. And so you end up in cliché. I think it happens in life. I mean, you know, there's not, there's not an enormous amount of... I, I, I had to fight with the producers of, of Hollyoaks because they said, OK, what accent are you going to use? He's a surgeon. I said, why can't he be scouts? And they just looked at me. They didn't have an answer. I said, you know, I said, you know, it doesn't mean it, it, just just the way he speaks and the way you know where he's from. It doesn't mean he can't can't improve it there. But that's not their first thought. You know, it's a bit of a hobby horse of mine um, because I just think whole. Somebody once said the propaganda you must most avoid, most carefully avoid, is the propaganda that comes from your own side. And I suppose that's a roundabout way of saying we can change it, but everybody needs to change it. You know, sort of don't don't butt up against the wall. You know, just don't accept it. Call it out when it's there. It's like you know, it's 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 another ism, isn't it? And it should be called out like any of the isms. You know, sort of it's it's wrong, but it's what you're dealing with. You know, I mean, I'm I'm I suppose to an extent slightly above it because. I've now got a nearly 40-year track record, so it doesn't affect me. But anybody starting out, there's a young, young lad who's just been working in in Hollyoaks, superb actor, lovely actor, plays Finn, like you know, playing a, playing a, a, a someone who's convicted of rape. He's a beautiful, beautiful actor. He's he's, he's in the moment all the time and stuff like this. One of the directors <coughs> who's been working with him knew he was leaving. He's going on to another big job. He said, "I'll get you in. I'll get you in." He could see him see him work and stuff like this. Just at the last day of his work, and he got vetoed because they couldn't believe him because of his accent. And he's playing a working class lad, but they wouldn't have a Scouse accent because it means too much, apparently. Yeah, that's what you're dealing with. So, plus ça change, plus la même chose. You know, I mean, it's 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 still there. But you just have to you, you have to kind of counter it where you can. You know. So that's very good advice, kids. Get a degree first. They get a degree that's, first. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyone else? Any other questions? Go on, mate. You're going to have buns of steel running up and down those stairs. <laughs> well, fr from a, a fellow Oldsverian, Joe, I must yeah. have been there at the same time as you, actually, sure. although... Uh, if, if it was the time of Father McMorrow and it Father... It was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, my form teacher. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> I know. Vile. Yeah. 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 What do they say about the Jesuits? Anyway. Yeah, it uh, doesn't matter. Give me yeah, a, yeah, yeah. a child until he is seven. I'll show you the map. Yeah. I also um, call them the Waffen SS of the Catholic oh, Church, but that's just me. You yeah. Know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, we can reminisce about this and bore everyone else silly. But yeah. uh, the question really is we're often said to be in a golden age of television at mm. the moment mm. um, in terms of TV drama, both the stuff that's produced in America and English series as well. And mm. I was just wondering what particularly you go out of your way to watch and what you particularly admire in TV drama at the moment. Um, I think we are in a kind of golden age. I mean, I th and I think it's mostly. Although it's kind of not popular from where I'm from, it's mostly America that's leading at the moment. Uh, we've seen the rise of in, in story terms, like the anti-hero. If you think of things like The Wire, Sopranos, Hill Street Blues, you know, all of those. So, so it's what they've done is they put the audience in a position where they're rooting for what in any other drama would be a villain. So it's turned it round on its head. I seek things out which push the envelope a little bit. Uh, in my reading, for instance, I, I, as I've got older, I read much, much less fiction. In fact, hardly any. You know, I, I, you know, I, I, somebody bought me a Sebastian Fox book and it, who I used to love, and I was like, I'd sooner read fact. You know, but, but the fiction I like is the fiction that pushes the envelope. What I seek out are things like genre-busting things, things like Killing Eve, things like Russian Doll. Uh, you know, a couple recently, the, the series called Ozark, which is, you know, genre busting in, in another way. Here, I'm not seeing a great deal. What I'm seeing is, is, is what the lady said here. What I'm seeing is an entrenchment of like kind of, you know, I don't care about posh people. I don't care about the people who work for posh people. I don't care. I just don't because it's been a new. I've got very little time for drama doctors either or nurses or policemen. I don't care unless there's something different. And if I see another tart with a heart or a copper with a past or the, these old tropes, I get bored like really, really easily. But that's possibly because I'm in, in the business. I just don't bother watching them. But stuff that genuinely pushes the envelope, possibly easier to talk about off the top of my head now in film. If you think of things like Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, if you think of The Truman Show, stuff which takes the genre and makes it magical, makes it super realistic. What, what the genre is supposed to do. A little bit like, you know, night and day I had a go at, you know, to, to make it up there. I'll, I'll, I'll seek things out which are, I was going to say twisted then, that's not what I mean, but like a, 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 a twist on the thing. I don't like stuff that's too violent. I'm bored of seeing scantily clad victims, female victims in things, and I'll turn off instantly. That's what we're being fed. If you seek it out, there's lots more interesting stuff, you know. Like I said, it's mostly coming from America. I just watched um, Billy Bob Thornton uh, in, uh, what's it called? <laughs> that show business, um, Goliath, which is it's a third series. It's about, about a lawyer, which again, normally makes me kind of do this, but he's interesting. It's a different character. And, and, and the way that the exposition, the way the story is told is, is different and interesting. That's what I look for. But, I've, but I will also vote with my feet. If I'm looking at something and I don't like it, I won't just carry on watching it. I'll, I'll move on to something else or I'll turn it off. You know, life's too short, I think. You know? Thank you for that. We've got one more. Um, Go on. Who wants the last question? There's a man that's going back in. I'm going there down. we go. Yeah. I'd just like to know why you were expelled from school. <laughs> Well, it was strange because I wasn't officially expelled. What they did is they disappeared me. They dis this is really, really what happened. I'd asked for a transfer at the end of every term. Um, I was singled out. You, you know, I was singled out. They decided for some reason I had a vocation, which my mum and dad, of course, being good Catholics, were like, oh, and I, I knew I didn't. But they decided on, they used to kind of, it's all this supposed to be this character building stuff. And I, I, was, I was a sensitive kid, you know, and, and I didn't need it. I, I was wanted to learn. I was happy to learn. I, was, I wanted to be there. I wanted to be good. And they started, like, kind of finding different ways to punish me for things I wasn't really doing because I was tall. It began, you know, sort of, if anything goes wrong in a class, you get punished. And they, they did. And so I, eventually they just knocked bits off me. Um, by the time it came to going into the fifth year, 
uh, O-level year. I'd already done a couple of O-levels early. We had a lower sixth remove there, you know, sort of, and I, I was quite good at a couple of subjects. So they, they'd let me do them early. And I'd gone, and I thought to myself, I'd chatted it over with my mum. I'd, I'd, I'd asked for a transfer. They said no. I went back to school on the first day of term, and my name wasn't on any of the class lists. Because I'd asked, there'd also, be, there'd also been an incident, let's just say, with one of the teachers who, who couldn't control his class. Uh, he was a physics teacher, and he was a little strange, specky individual, you know, sort of, like, I don't mean that, you know, sort of, I mean, you know, it's like one of these, like, like, like a cartoon character, couldn't control the class. And he'd attacked me. He'd attacked me with a board ruler out of frustration. Um, so I punched him back and I laid him out. Um, and I immediately went to the, the headmaster myself. I had a cut on my head. I went to the headmaster myself and I said, do you want me to get my dad up to the school or do you want me to get like a, a friend of mine who's, who's assistant bishop of Liverpool? I said, do you want me to get Father Tom up here? I said, this no good. And they went, no, 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 let's, let's talk it down. I did get Father Tom up and they said, OK, it's fine. But they'd marked my card. So basically what happened is I went back with a new blazer, new bag and everything, thinking to myself, this is O-levels year, let's just knuckle down, I'll soon be out of here anyway. And my name wasn't on any of the lists, so I wasn't officially expelled. I was disappeared. They even went as far as I, uh, on my second marriage, um, I was married first time in a registry office, on my second marriage, my then wife decided, wanted to get married in a church, and so I spoke to Tom and she, dis <laughs> she chose the only Jesuit church in the central London. Um, and I went to them and I said, oh, you know, I, I, you know first, first marriage wasn't, you know, in a church, so can, I, can we get married in a church? Yes, yes, and, well, you know, what's your connection with the Jesuits? I said, well, I went to, to you know, Admiral and Day Glory, and I knew all the spiel. I said, I went to SFX. And they, when I next met, Martin, they, he said, why did you lie? You never went to SFX. I went, what? They take me off the list. They take me off the class list. It happened again, I wrote for a reference and they'd removed me from the classes. I genuinely went there, and this, this genuinely happened. There were just some very, very, very odd individuals at that place. And I managed to get under the skin of a couple of them. And that was it. From, from going to, from being a very, very happy, voracious learner to couldn't be asked, didn't take very long. You know, sort of, and it, and it, was, it was 20 odd years before I picked up my education again at the Open University, but, uh, because I just, I couldn't see any sense in it. What's the point? You know, it, was not, it wasn't a meritocracy. And the people in power then, I, I, I considered especially, you know, evil. So long answer to a short question, but there you are, you know. Mm -hmm. I was never a bad lad. Never was. I just used to get blamed for other things. It's one of those things. You know. What did you do at the OU? Uh, I did an open science degree, so I could cherry pick. I've got one more module to complete it, actually. Um, which I'm, I'm going to do soon now, be better than at Holyoaks, because I wanted something which was out of my comfort zone. I didn't want to be doing something that was like English or to do with language and stuff. I've always had a keen interest in science, particularly in how we think in brain biology and, and all of that. So the open science degree and enabled me to kind of go back and, and redo my biology and do chemistry and then move on to the things which I'm really interested in, uh, you know, about memory and, and, and things. And, uh, I've, I've got to say, anybody's ever thinking about doing the Open University, do. It's a fantastic resource. They've got fantastic, superb tutors and, and, and all of that. I was doing, the last time I did any serious study, and I, a couple of years ago, I was doing, a, I was doing Calendar Girls. I was playing the husband, so I was dead in the first act. Fantastic. So I was studying in the second act. I was in my dressing room doing all my CMAs and stuff. So it works. Um, but like I say, you know, it, it, was, it, it wasn't the same for everybody. But for me, I, I, it, it put me off formal education for a number of years. That's good. Yeah. Thank you very much, Joe. Let's not have an advert for that university. Let's have a quick advert for Let's this, have an advert this, this, this university. Come on. Yeah. And let me just tell you about a couple of other things we've got coming up. Tomorrow is part of the Festival of Ideas. We're at the Tate in Liverpool for a one-day conference on the Lancashire artist Leonora Carrington. We've got some amazing uh, art filmmakers and musicians there responding to Carrington's work. Next week, we have former head of the PFA, Clark Carlyle, mm -hmm. will be here in conversation, uh, talking about his, uh, his charity work, his campaigns for, for good mental health. Next Friday, we have Rita Tushingham, wow. the actress uh, from Taste of Honey, amongst uh, many other great, great works. Um, and she'll be here with us next Friday. All the events are on the Edge Hill web, website, uh, just Google Festival of Ideas and uh, 
uh, you, 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 you find them. But that's, that's for later. For tonight, let's thank Joe for his time and his very generous responses. Thank you.